to welcome you um, to the final um, conclusion of our 200th anniversary lecture series. We've had, as some of you who've been loyal attenders um, will know, a extremely distinguished panel of speakers, lots of topics representing the breadth of Birkbeck's interests. But I think probably today we are coming to the sort of crux of what Birkbeck has been about for the last 200 years, which is really social mobility. Um, and so I'm delighted that we have with us Stephen Cooper, who is going to speak about social mobility in business, and most importantly is in conversation with Spiros Rastana, who is one of our graduates who has taken courses at Birkbeck. So here we have a shining light um, of the Birkbeck experience. I was saying to Stephen earlier that um, when we interview for new academics, some of you um, academics at Birkbeck may have been interviewed by me. Ron certainly wasn't because he was well before um, my time when he was interviewed. We do ask ourselves if it's a wet, dark November evening, would the, speak, would the lecturer be able to inspire the students? So this is the challenge <laughs> for both of you tonight um, on this. Now, of course, Stephen, um, we know we'll be able to do that in his distinction as the chief executive of the Aldermore um, Banking Group and somebody who was um, a joint chair of the Social um, Mobility Initiative. And of course, he himself, I think, is an example of social mobility. Somebody who started, left school at 16, started at Barclays and rose up through the ranks, made a terrible mistake on the way by going to do a degree at London Guildhall half time in the evening <laughs> instead of coming here. And he hasn't been able to provide me um, with a satisfactory explanation for that. Um, but he did go on to greater things at Harvard Business School, had an extremely successful career, and I think he has a great passion for social mobility. He's going to be in conversation, interviewed um, by Spria, um, who is a leading um, journalist, and as I say, one of our graduates. When you read the um, bump about people like her, you find all these sorts of awards that they're the leading young person in this, they're in the whatever. But she has a distinction, which we were speaking about earlier, to be in the top 50 for kindness in leadership. Wow. So, Spria, I ask you to be kind to Stephen. He didn't, he didn't come to Birkbeck, but we would like to show Birkbeck hospitality to him. So please be kind to him and everybody else. Please enjoy the, um, the conversation and the interaction. And there will be time for questions as well um, to both our panelists later. Panelists. Okay, so I think we can we can start. Um, very, very warm welcome to you all. Um, welcome, Stephen. Um, I'm Spriya Shravastav. Um, I'm uh, the UK Bureau Chief for Insider, also an executive editor. Um, and I think today, today what, when we talk about social mobility, it's, it's a very, very important topic. I think when we talk about businesses generally, we tend to talk a lot about profits. We talk about how they're scaling, how sustainable they are, and how um, you know, how some of those things actually work in the, in the larger economic context. But I think today when we talk about, today I think we're going to keep all of that aside and we're going to talk about social mobility, which is a very, very important aspect from societal perspective. Um, we see we're living in a world with rising inequality. Um, and so it is more than more important than ever to talk about social mobility. So I think without further ado, I want to first of all ask you, and I generally tend to do this in um, any of the conversations that I lead, is Let's break down the term. So let's, what, what does social mobility mean to you? And then I want to sort of talk a little bit about your journey as well. So yeah. let's get started with the meaning of social mobility. According so to you. the definite, or what, you know, how I think about social mobility, going back really to my days as co-chair of the Social Mobility Commission, is that the circumstance of your birth should not <laughs> dictate the outcome of your life. That should be your choice, and you should be fully aware of all the choices that are in front of you. So no, no matter where you start off, you should end up in a place that you are happy with through decisions that you have been informed about and decisions that you have therefore made. Just one point I will pick up on. Um, I, I run uh, a fairly significant specialist bank. People in here, well, actually, you do know of us, having recently opened an account. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> Personal information, I should be careful. Um, uh, but we're in closed quarters. But... Um, I do a lot of investor roadshows, and increasingly those investors do ask me about diversity in the business for a very real reason. The more diverse your leadership team, 
statistically, the better your performance tends to be, particularly through time. So these are hard-nosed commercial fund managers who largely get measured on returns of other people's money that they invest. And the first question they ask me increasingly is, how diverse is your business? That's great to know. So I, I think increasingly, yeah, clearly you need to deliver the numbers and everything else, but yeah. that is a very significant question that now gets asked a lot and they want data. Yeah, so it's not just a tick in the box, you would say. No, there is a real no. moving the needle that you see yeah. that's happening. And then the, the, sec- the other point I'll make on that is um, if you treat or if you believe social media or gender diversity or whatever else is a nice to do, and there is an element of nice to do around equality and, and so forth, you won't, nothing will really get done. Because mm-hmm. when the times are tough, times are tough at the moment, people here are experiencing that, we're experiencing that. Uh, it's very easy to stop that sort of activity. In my experience, it's a must-do. It's a must-do to get access to the widest possible talent pool. It's a must-do to make sure you get diverse thinking, experience, and background on your leadership team. That turns into better outcomes. And increasingly, particularly for younger people, most people in this room are younger than me, sadly, um, uh, they want to be associated with companies that represent people like them. If they, If that company does not, they will take their purchasing power elsewhere. So from a business point of view, in my view, and I think it's starting to play out in terms of data, it's a must do. And increasingly, executives are being measured against it. Yeah, that's great to know. That's a really good start. Before I go on to talk about your professional journey, um, one um, sort of just little note that we will be doing question and answers towards the second half of this um, of this conversation. So start thinking about your questions, make a note. And um, what we'll do is spend the next 20, 25 minutes in a conversation with Stephen and then open the floor. So please keep your questions ready. So let's talk about your professional journey. Talk to us about how, you know, I know we've just heard that you were at Barclays and how, how did you sort of rise the ranks what challenges did you face um i mean i i left school at 16 did gcse's i think i did okay in those state school um that frankly i had to leave school and help put some money on the table at home i had a uh my mum was a cleaner and in and out of hospital with mental health issues um so i had to to help out and um i just ended up the first job I applied for, I got, and I was the post boy at Barclays in, in the uh, Holloway Road branch, not a million miles from here. It's right next door to the ladies' prison. So you had some interesting customers. Uh, sometimes they weren't, you know, they weren't on their own. They came with somebody else in, in handcuffs as they were being released into to society. But, um, uh, and at 16, I mean, I was the lowest possible level. Um, and at that age, I didn't really think about a career. I was helping out at home. Uh, I was playing a lot of sport and doing what 16 year olds do. Um, and then nothing really happened for three years or so. And then four of us were put onto the Barclays graduate program as non-graduates, the first four ever. And what's amazing about that is of that four, two left quite quickly for whatever reason, and two are still in that organization nearly 30 years later. Myself, we've gone to that second, uh, and a good mate of mine who ended up being head of equity research for an investment bank globally. Right. So if you think about the organization, and I don't know how they spotted us, and we had to go through some really bizarre interviews, um, but they got a pretty good return on that. Yeah, that's actually that's what that was my next question. How did how did they how did they come to you? Because um, generally, the graduate tra- trainee programs, you've, I mean, the, the process is very yeah, it's intense. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah look, I've lots never been of, through lots that. of interviews. Yeah, um, uh, and I, I didn't know anyone who had been through yeah. that. So no, no one in my family had been to university or yeah. or anything else. So that was a while. It was quite intimidating because I didn't know how to do an interview. Yeah, I had one interview for a job as a postboy, and I, and I got it. So I had no real experience. I had no real role model. There wasn't much aspiration around me. Um, so I don't really know how that assessment was made, candidly. Um, but it took, and if you go through a sort of career, along the way, people opened a door or put an arm around my shoulder or occasionally gave me a kick up the backside because we all need that from time to time. Um, and I don't think I would have got to where I got to, if I can say that, without them. Yeah. Um, and that's the biggest thing. And I think as I learned from that, it's, um, so a couple of times I, there were three occasions that were probably, maybe four occasions that were quite pivotal. Um, and it wasn't easy being a non-graduate on a graduate program because mm-hmm. it was full of graduates and I wasn't a graduate. Yeah. 
and I was a couple of years older than than the others, and they, they were you know, they joined together, went through a process together, and we hadn't apart from this four. We became a little, I guess, a little clique in our own right. Um, and I got put through the graduate program, which is meant to be four years, and I got taken off it after eighteen months. Mm-hmm. I was at the level at the time I wasn't given a choice, but I was given a significant promotion. Actually, it wasn't great in hindsight because I missed out on another couple of years of learning and getting experience. And if you get the opportunity to do that in your working environment, people here are committed because they're here in the evening, take that opportunity because it doesn't come back to you as you go through your career because you've then got to perform or deliver or whatever else. So the more opportunity you get to learn, stretch, grow uh, other things, take that opportunity. Um, But twice I turned down a promotion to learn something different. Um, and a third time I chose to also turn down a promotion in the UK and go and live and work in Africa. Wow. And it taught me a ton of things about culture, how to run a bank end to end. And I remember doing things like, um, doing a leveraged buyout of a mobile phone company for hundred million dollars. We, in, in, partly in, in the UK, you think, well, we'll give you a loan for hundred million dollars. Well, where do I get a hundred million dollars from to lend you? And you might want to borrow it for 10 years, but you'll only give it to me for a year. So how do I manage that yeah. through? Um, and then at the time, HIV was very prevalent and there wasn't really proven medication for it. And it's quite a stigma and all the cultural things around that. You know, and frankly, I was a white man leading a business in a non-white country. Mm-hmm. Um, so that also brought complications. And so I, I learned a great deal from that. So I ended up sort of running, coming back to the UK, but running retail banking, business banking, and Bartley Card globally. But it was those experiences along the way that taught me a lot about people, culture, how things work. And I don't think I would, I would not have got to that level um, if I hadn't taken those opportunities to do things differently. And it came up at the time I missed the pay rise and I saw someone else get that job. I thought, I know I'm better than you. Yeah. And that was hard. You know, I had a mortgage and stuff and bills to pay. But... Um, that was definitely uh, enabled me to stretch and grow. That's a fascinating story. And I'm going to come back to, to a little bit about training and how and mentorship in, in a while. But what, just want to sort of take a step back here. And, you know, when you when you look at and you touched on this a little while ago, when you look at businesses around you, uh, when you look at other companies, I think if you look at data, I think UK has one of the lowest levels of social mobility in the developed world. Um, when you look around you, what what are the challenges that you see with companies, with businesses? What is the responsibility that they have that they are not able to meet and what's stopping them really at this stage? So, I mean, there's there's many things to mm-hmm. that. I mean, the reason I left Barclays in the end, and I spent, you know, I was there from the age of 16 to 47, so a long time. It's all I knew. Um, and there were only three jobs in the organisation that were bigger than what I had. But I knew I wasn't going to get them, partly because I wasn't an investment banker by background. I did spend a bit of time in investment banking, but not enough really to lead that organization but i saw something start to happen which was a new chief executive only really put people around him or promoted people into him who came from uh ivy league east coast background Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i wasn't that um and i so you know he didn't want to see people from different backgrounds and i saw group think happen around him that led to some of the things you've seen play out in the media around barclays Uh, and I decided to leave. But um, if I think about where businesses get it right or wrong and what, why they should do that, um, I remember I was running retail banking and I was in Cardiff. I went to see a call centre there. <laughs> and the phone was ringing and no one was answering. That's not a good thing to happen in a call centre. <laughs> and um, you think, well, why is that? So I spoke to the teams and they said, we can't recruit people. So why can't you recruit people? Have I got in the way of this? You know, can't let, let you recruit. That wasn't the issue. The issue was um, we can't find the right people. We said, well, at the time, Cardiff had the highest rate of unemployment in the UK. How can that be? Yeah. Turns out we were asking for people to have A-levels to apply for a call centre job. I don't think you need any qualification to work in a call centre. I want people who want to answer the phone and want to help someone or want to be part of a team. So... We took what we realised was, well, why are we asking for these qualifications that, frankly, don't need to do a job? I'm much more interested in the person, not the qualification. 
So we took away all qualifications. Then we got a ton more of, of applicants. What we then also realised is that because they hadn't been to a high level of education or maybe hadn't been through an interview process before, how do you actually interview those people? How do they even get to an interview? And in some cases, they don't have the money to get to an interview. Um, so you really had to put a lot of process in place uh, to do that. So we created an apprenticeship scheme. Uh, and by the time I left running retail banking, I think it was two or three years later than that, we had 2,000 apprentices. Mm -hmm. um, their engagement rate was through the roof. I think less than 1% of those left the organization their own choice. Mm -hmm. Um, and they did a fabulous job. Some are going on to leadership and management positions. And if ever I had a team who people felt that, you know, a bit cynical or life's too tough, I'd put one of these apprentices in there. They soon brought it to life because they felt, frankly, lucky to have an opportunity that others hadn't given them. I had tremendous loyalty from them, and I had access to a talent pool that I'd previously closed down. It was dumb on our part. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting point. And I think sort of brings me to the next question where, you know, a lot of companies and a lot of organizations, they, they make a lot of effort in bringing people in through the door, as yeah. you said. But what happens after that? What's the support that you provide? As you rightly said, that there may be people who have never been in an interview before. There may be people who probably, you know, when you say, could you put together this PowerPoint presentation? They probably don't know what you're talking about. How can companies sort of invest more? How can companies ensure that um, there is adequate training, adequate mentorship, ad adequate coaching along the line? So you're, it's not just, yes, you know, come on in and then, and then that's it. Um, and I think there is there is a bit of that at the moment across the across the business. Very keen to hear your views yeah. on that. So I guess I I experienced that myself more by luck than any process that Barclays had in place. Um, what we realised with the apprenticeship scheme, um, and I've got one at Aldermore and the same sort of thing. So one is how do you get people to an interview? Often we pay for their train fares and so forth. Um, what are you going to wear? Yeah. And then how do you help people through an interview process? And you have to also adapt the process to get the best out of the individual. So if you've had someone who's been in interviewing people for five, 10 years, they're probably not the best people to do it. So again, you have to think about uh, who is in that interview process. Often you want to have people like who you're interviewing because they want to see people who represent people like them. And therefore they start to feel, well, if you can do this job, so can I. So you put them at ease. Um, and then once you do get them the job, we had to do things like um, fairly basic life, which I thought was fairly basic life skills, such as, well, if you're going to need to be in this workplace five days a week and you need to be there at, say, nine o'clock Monday morning, how are you going to get there? Mm -hmm. um, and what are you going to do for lunch? And how are you going to make sure tomorrow that you've got whatever you're going to wear and it's appropriate and, and so forth? And how do you have conversations with other people? Um, how are you going to manage your financial life from one payday to the next? Because there isn't much budgeting skills or, or teaching done in the schools. So a lot of it was actually, and we put together an eight-week course to do a lot of those sort of basic life skills. Um, that was one thing. As an organisation, what we then found is we were getting good, diverse people in, um, but we were not getting diverse people up. Yeah. And some of that comes with... Um, well, okay, so again, what qualifications do you want? We did, we changed a lot of the way we put job um, adverts together internally. We found out actually we're using quite masculine language in some cases. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what that looked like, but it turns out when we changed some words, we had a lot more females apply. Yeah. We took focus much more on experience as opposed to a, an academic qualification. Um, we did things like um, uh, mentorship around that, which mm -hmm. is really just helping people. One of the things I, I, which I found excruciating at the time, although I did it in a lovely way. So um, there's a guy called John Varley, who was a quintessential British gentleman who was chief executive of Barclays for, for a while. Um, and I had to do a presentation to the board and I gave it to him first. And he went through correcting my spelling and my grammar. It was oh. torturous. But I didn't have, frankly, I didn't have that as an education. Yeah. And he did it in a lovely way, so I didn't feel particularly small. Uh, and he never critiqued or moaned. He just changed it and gave it back to me. Basically, what he was saying to me is, if you take this to the board, the board are not going to hear your message because they're going to get distracted by your poor grammar. Yeah. Uh, 
And after that, you know, I had a tool and you know, I just grammar checked everything on Google or whatever else. But it's that sort of support you need to put around people. It's rarely around intellect or drive. It's the, they've not had the, I mean, education is still the single biggest influence on social mobility, but it's not alone. Often yeah. it's confidence. Yeah. That's great. That's a really good point there. And um, just on that, some amazing success stories from you and very, very inspiring, really. And, but, you know, just, I take a step back and I think that you have been so aware of and been so intuitive about all of this because you, you as you said, you've got, ha- experienced a lot of this yourself. Um, there are not a lot of CEOs out there who think like you. Mm. Right. So I think the challenge very much is um, how do we how do we inculcate or how do we facilitate this sort of thinking across the board? Um, So more and more CEOs can actually start thinking like that. So I go back to why should they think about it? Yeah. And if if it's all about a nice to do. Good. But you will not get sustainability from that because when times get tough, that's the first thing to get cut. It has to be a must do. And I go back to the point I made earlier. Why would you close yourself? I mean, go back to my Cardiff example. Why did I close myself down to some great people? Because mm-hmm. I put arbitrary qualification places that I don't need. Uh, it is point one. Um, if you are driving a revenue line, if you're not opening yourself up to, I'm trying to think of an example, but um, if you are, I mean, it depends who you're trying to ultimately sell to, but if you are a scale retailer, <laughs> If you don't have people you know, on your tills, in your management um, uh, teams making decisions or that represent the society they're trying to, to sell. It's slightly sensitive. I go back to when I first landed in Africa. Mm-hmm. You had uh, a, a largely white board in a largely non-white country. Yeah. I mean, none of did that look awful. Just think about how the customers, the colleagues felt about that. Yeah. It came across as slightly elitist and actually that leadership team did not understand what it was like to live in that environment and therefore were not able to put together products, propositions, services that really appeal to that society. And that business underperformed as a result. Yeah, that's a great example. And I'm sure there are lots of examples like this, and I definitely want to delve into it. But before we open the floor to question and answer, I want to touch a little bit on education. And you mentioned, you briefly mentioned that, you know, education is a driver of social mobility, but not the only driver. Um, And I think that's where I want to sort of get your views on what institutions and academic institutions with so much history, like Birkbeck, 200 years of so much work, what what are they doing right? And what can they do more, really, to drive social mobility, to sort of make sure that it's not, you know, it's, it's it's an effort that's not just from one university, but across the board, really. So... I mean, there's a number of things I would say. Just I should give an example in the last mm-hmm. question, if I get just a bit much help with this one. But yeah. if you look at the top seven legal firms in the UK, their top decile of performers, however you define performer, all come from non-fee-paying schools. Mm-hmm. If they weren't, so for whatever reason, they've been able to perform well, you know, pretty determination and so forth and get through the ranks. I don't think they had a leg up getting through the ranks, but they persevered, they got there. They now generate a disproportionate share of the fee income for those top legal firms in the UK. So you go back to you need to make sure you are diverse and opening yourselves up to the best possible time. I use it as a real hard commercial example because yeah. that's super important. Uh, another one would be what we found at the Social Mobility Commission. We had a really progressive head of the civil service um, uh, and... <laughs> we got into trouble actually. She opened up all her data on the civil service to us as a commission in terms of looking at the social background uh, of people in civil service. What we found was actually the civil service are really good at getting diverse people into the civil service, mm-hmm. really poor at getting them up. Mm-hmm. So it's something like, I can't remember the exact stat now, but something like 70 or 80% of the top two senior tiers of leadership in the civil service all came from fee paying schools. Even worse, if you look at high court judges. come from top five, how we've defined top, but from the same five fee-paying schools. Hardly representative of people they are having in front of them. Yeah. That just, it doesn't feel right, but it's not representative. And therefore you tend to come to to less poor outcomes. Um, And uh, what the civil service is saying is actually they were making, good people, 
but they were making decisions on policy for a society for which they did not fully represent or fully understand. And therefore, that turns into poorer quality policy, poorer quality advice or guidance to politicians. So getting a broader representative is super, super important. They took on 13 recommendations from us uh, to get people going through the ranks much better and, and now are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the the Secretary of State at the time who had responsibility for um, uh, the civil service, which is, goes to the Secretary of State for the Cabinet Office, wasn't too happy over that until we sort of said, well, maybe it looks progressive and maybe that's a good thing for you. And anyway. Yeah. Um, but to go back to the points here, um, I was struck by, I went to Oldham, uh, which is home of the fish and chip, who knew, um, and is one of the five poorest boroughs in the UK. And I went to, and there's no scale employer there, and they probably get the rub end of um, funding from the uh, Manchester mayoral area. Um, they've got an amazing FE college there, really good facilities, a really progressive head. In fact, he's just become the new chair of the Social Mobility Commission. Um, and it's actually the, the guy who made a difference there. There was the head of the, happens to be Labour run um, council. And he pulled together, convened local FE college. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's even a university in Oldham. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, he pulled together, convened local SMEs who are ultimately, they create the employment in the area uh, and said, what, what do you need from people here for the jobs that you have on offer? Yeah. And he connected them with the FE college who then listened to that and created experiential courses to meet their needs and frankly attracted younger people to want to do those courses. Yeah. Amazing. That's great. And you saw the results come out from that. If you were a teacher going to, I mean, you'd want to be in that FE college, great facilities and you're impacting people's lives. It must be super fulfilling. What's the issue? Really poor quality housing. If you're a teacher with two young kids, you go to move into that area, 50%, most people rent, the, the housing quality is poor and 50% who of people who rent change property every six months. So just think you're moving to the area with a young family, you can't even get a sense of community because half the people around you are going to move in six months' time. Yeah. And therefore, that was falling down. So you need all these little things to intersect and come together. But that was the best example I saw of the impact the, in that case, an FE college was having in the local community, engaging with uh, stakeholders in that community as to what that community needs. Yeah. And it's really positively impacting lives. Yeah, that's a great example. Um, I think I'm going to pause here and just open the floor for any questions. Um, and yeah, any questions from anyone? Yeah. If you could state your name um, and also please ask the question then. Thank you. My name is Daj and I'm a recent student at Berkeley. I haven't worked. In, so could you uh, speak up a little bit? So I haven't worked professionally for a few years. I thought I needed a break. So on the student again. Oh, good so for my, you. Que <laughs> my question is uh, on what led you to become a student after having worked for a number of years? So when I got put onto the graduate program as a non-graduate, the deal was I had to go and get a degree. Um, rightly or wrongly, but that's what the deal was. Yep. Um, and uh, it was uh, to go to night school. Um, I put the time in, the bank paid if I passed. So there was an incentive. So I, think, I think I had to pay first. I'll come if I paid first and they reimbursed me. Whether I think I think they gave me a loan, which if I failed or didn't go to, I, I'm assuming I had to pay back. Yeah, um, I don't think I, yeah, I passed. So, um, but I learned a great deal from it. One, I kind of, well, I hadn't been to university, so I enjoyed that side of it in terms of social interaction. I thought the quality of the lecture was really good. They've got some great ones here. Um, Two is, it's quite a commitment to go, I mean, you're here in your free time and it is a, not particularly cold, but it is a damp November night. There's plenty of other places you'd probably rather be, but you're here. Um, and I like that in terms of people that I recruit because that shows a determination, a commitment and energy. Um, and I'd much rather have that than some academic qualification. And I learned a lot from the people I was in the room with because if you wanted to talk about something, safe environment to do that. They're probably going through the same sort of things that you were doing. And I didn't feel safe having that conversation in the workplace. So it was, I, I, I got a lot from it. I didn't miss many lectures. 
<laughs> Might have been late a few times. But... <laughs> Any more questions? It's one here and then. I think he was first and the second. Okay, and then after that. Uh, hi there, Andrew Carroll, a uh, big back graduate. And uh, one time Lloyd's TSB um, employee from a since. Uh, um, just to ask you about uh, the couple of years before you, le uh, you left school, um, I'm reading between the lines, you acted as a kind of a carer, I suppose, for your, uh, for your mother and that. And I, I noticed whenever um, young kids are in that role and they're interviewed, they always come across as quite older and wiser than their years. And with a you know a very different approach to your normal teenager who's more used to having their their mess cleared up by somebody than yeah. than they being in that role. I'm wondering if that uh, affected you in a, a particular way to make you into that kind of more pragmatic person, and if that was picked up on by the Barclays guys when you're in the post room. Um, it's a very well, well well thought through point. Um, I don't know is the answer. I definitely did have to take on a caring type responsibility for a an unwell parent uh, and a younger sister and a younger sister um which to a certain extent makes you grow up in, at one level uh, but certainly mature in other levels but um uh probably is the answer i think it goes back to really employers should make decisions on attributes and experiences rather than academic and i say to people my own kids um and we have an apprenticeship program where i am is I'm really interested in what I get with you as an individual. So what do I get with Andrew? Because frankly, I'm going to see a ton of people. Uh, and how do you differentiate on a CV from this degree or that qualification or two years working here, work, working there? I'm really interested in what I get with you. Um, and what are you going to bring to the workplace or to the team? And if we're going to spend part of every day together, frankly, am I going to want to be in your company every day and, and vice versa? So I do think that is a really important part. And when I say to young people, because frankly, you haven't got a lot to put on your CV when you are particularly young, um, bring to life you and decisions you've made and why you have made those decisions and what you have learned from those decisions, because that's what you understand from the individual. And I think to, so I don't know why they chose that. I'm, I mean, the, the interview process was odd. I mean, I think it's a slightly odd guy, but, um, Two things I remember in one of in one of the conversations. One is, uh, as as I walked into the room, something rolled along the floor, and you looked down, and um, it was clearly not live, but it was a hand grenade. I mean, oh I think he was looking for a reaction, so I just picked it up and put it back on the table, um, uh, and then I did get a bit aerated with him because. Um, Barclays was going through a cost-cutting it. So I, I worked in a branch. So I didn't understand strategy and head office and any of that sort of stuff. And I hadn't had that sort of education or upbringing. Uh, they did do a good job, actually, after that. They sent me to McKinsey for a year. I learned how to use data and yeah. think strategic and so forth. But um, I got quite irritated with him because he was saying, what do you think about cost-cutting and so forth? And I said, well, here's the thing. I work in this very nice corporate branch. And uh, there's a very extensive wine cellar for nice customer lunches. Uh, and by the way, you're just firing a, uh, a cashier who's on, I don't know, 15,000 pounds a year. How do you think that's okay? Uh, no, he didn't answer that, but yeah. I think that's probably, I think that's probably what got me on that program. Yeah, that's great. Um, can we have a question here? Hi, I'm Beth Peters. Hi. Um, earlier... At the very beginning, you talked about how you were grilled on um, diversity and inclusion and um, performance and sets um, during investor growth shows. I'd love to know what you're most proud of, um, kind of amongst your achievements at Aldermore and across your career in, in that perspective, and also the area of the stats that maybe you'd rather them not probe so <laughs> closely, <laughs> and why you find that so challenging. So, um, great question. I'm not sure how to answer it. Let me give you a couple of points, if I may. Um, so, I have replaced where I am the entire executive team, bar one, um, 
And I did that for a variety of reasons, primarily because of capability. And that's why I was brought in to, to fix it. Um, that's a really hard job. I did 400 hours of interviewing my first 12 months. And what I found also was, okay, so how do I get a balanced team? Now, I'm not going to compromise on quality or experience or, or capital. And by the way, I'm in a regulated business, so that's, it comes with some of the roles I can't just appoint someone. I have to get regulatory approval for them. Um, and I, stereotypically, I thought, okay, head of HR, chief people officer, I can definitely get a woman to do that role. And I had a short list of eight people, seven of whom were women. Who did I, who do you think I put into that role? The man. Yeah. Now, I took a bit of flat from that, but I chose the best candidate and he's been an outstanding hire. Now, I did go and find a, a female chief technology officer, which is quite unusual. I'm about to appoint a female chief risk officer and I've, done a, I've been looking for that person for a year. So I will not compromise on quality. Um, but I've got to think now a really good team. They make my life both easy and hard. Hard because they push me and challenge me. Easy because they deliver. Uh, and I'm definitely better as a result of them. And I try to hire people who, um, the last thing I want is 10 Stephen Coopers. The last thing I want is 10 people who are going to agree with everything that I say. Uh, sometimes I care for what I wish for. Um, but it definitely brings the best out of the business. So I would say what I'm proud of there, um, I've got pretty much a near 50-50, so nearly 50-50 gender split. I was, when I first went there two and a half years ago, um, I inherited a target that the previous CEO had had of getting the number of women in the top two tiers of management to be uh, 30%. And it never got out of the teens. And I was asked by the board, do you want to remove or change that target? Now, there was some temptation there. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting it was a woman that asked that question to me. And I remember saying to her, this is how I felt, which is, I wonder if that's quite tempting given the gap. By the way, I'm gonna get paid on this, uh, amongst other things. Um, but if I was a woman in this business and a man made that decision, I'd be deeply unhappy. So I said, I am gonna change the target and we're gonna increase it to 40% but give me two years. Uh, I missed that target, but I got to 38. Uh, and I've gone beyond 40 since. And part of that, in some roles, uh, I went to market through a search firm and they came back saying, we can't find any women. I mean, really? Really? So um, I fired that search firm and, and, and started again. So I insist on um, always having a gender balanced um, uh, split on a shortlist, all of whom, all of whom must benchmark for the role. Then it's down to the choice of the hiring manager. And by the way, they always choose the man. That will then turn into an interesting conversation. I'm using that around gender because that's actually at the moment that's the easiest thing to measure uh, and get data on. What we've done on social mobility is that we have um, uh, engagement surveys every full one every year, and I do pulses on that uh, every quarter to get a sense of how people are feeling. And we've asked ourselves the question, so what is your social background? That's quite a hard question to ask because when you sort of, well, are you demographic, A, B, C, D, or E, what does that mean? There are ways of asking that question. There are four simple questions that tend to get a very good response rate. And that's typically like, what is the occupation of your highest earning parent? Um, or were you on free school meals? That's, that's a crude measure because actually the people who have the hardest time, typically those who are just above school free school meals, don't quite qualify, but are really squeezed because they get no, no support. Um, and then of course, what are you going to do with that data? And people want to know, is it anonymous? Are you going to embarrass me? What are you going to do with that? And so forth. Um, but we've started to collate that data because if you don't have data, you can't measure it. You can't tell what your organization is. You can't therefore see what you do. And what we find um, we had a couple of years ago is good diversity of background coming into the organization partly because of what we do, which is we help people get a home, for example, the first time that mainstream banks will not. That drives great people in because they like to go home and say they've done that rather than on a, on a spreadsheet or something. And we've done a lot of work now to make sure that we are progressing that talent through the organisation. So, um, yeah, hopefully that answers it. I'm not sure there's anything I wouldn't like to be looked at, but I'm sure there are things I can do a lot better. Any more questions? 
Um, I'm a book back graduate, and I've done a bit of research actually in diversity, a bit more with arts and culture, but around different areas. And my question is if there is a policy for more social mobility, particularly from you know, getting people into leadership, there's a big gap in action. <laughs> what might be some recommendations, or are there any ways to check this? Or as an industry, how can people be more accountable? That's a great question, yeah. yeah how can so we enforce it? So it is not yet a protected characteristic uh, to the extent that gender and ethnicity is. What a protected characteristic means is two things. One is companies will increasingly have to report out on their representation and a pay gap. Um, and most organizations who do that today on gender, it obviously shows usually a pay gap between male and female. Um, very few companies, I think, pay differently men and women for the same job. Frankly, they do that, they're gonna be out of business pretty damn quick in my experience. But they tend to have more higher paid uh, senior roles occupied by men. So uh, that's what you do need, I think, on occasions, targets and so forth to do that. By the way, I don't know anyone who wants a job that they don't meritocratically um, benchmark for and get. Um, I do think that will come with background. I think almost certainly there'll be a change of government. And if it's a Labour-led government, you've seen already there's talking a lot about that. So I think that will come. So policy, I think, will come. And some companies will find that very hard. One, because they haven't got the data. And two, I think they'll find themselves in a very awkward position. But that, that's through, through policy. It really comes down to, as an organisation, are you collating the data and then using that? And uh, I've partnered with um, she's a very good former Secretary of State Justin Greening, who's super passionate about this, uh, very articulate in approach. Uh, in some ways, you'd want to forget which government it is. You'd want her in government because she's very good. I think she got fed up with the whole Westminster thing, so she's trying to have influence from outside. Uh, we've written to all of the FTSE uh, CEOs to say, start collating data. This is why you should think about it. It's a good thing to do. Um, these are the four simple questions you can put into a staff survey. They tend to get you a very good response rate, and then you can start to do something around it. Um, you know, if, I do, if I'm pushing people to do that, I've got to do it myself, and I did do it myself. I, I chair Experian, the data company in the UK. They've now done it. They're a much bigger uh, company. They're FTSE top 30. So I, I think it's gaining some traction. But it's a combination of um, carrot and stick. One or the other on their own rarely work. Just on, on the back of that, I mean, I think we're talking about like, you know, on a policy level, yes, changes will be seen eventually, but we're talking about big companies, big institutions. And if you want to change that behavior, really, do you think tying it to like a financial incentive or um, a bonus or things like that, would something like that would essentially push yeah. C-suite executives yeah. to actually think like that? Because you what know, gets you measured to gets done. Exactly, right? So, so we need to get that in KPIs or yeah. goals. I mean, why do you think my, my gender target? Yeah. Um, I did say, I mean, I rounded it up, yeah. you know, so I missed it by 2%, but I rounded it up. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a, bit more, you know, there's a bit more judgment and pragmatism in, in it in reality. But the reason I wanted it there is because I wanted my team and the organisation to treat it seriously. Um, and I reinforced it in a scorecard because I don't think there had been any consequence to the previous leader or leadership team around not achieving that. If, you're not, if there isn't consequence one way or the other, why bother having it? Yeah. But you should have... Um, the targets or metrics that make the biggest impact to your business. Yeah. Um, and I go back to what I said earlier, the more diverse you are, the better decisions you will end up making. So is that something that you do at Aldermore for your reports, for instance? Would, you, would that be part of their goals and targets? Yes. Okay. So we started with gender. Yeah. Uh, we will move to uh, background and ethnicity. Um, I measure it on things like, um, so we... You know, we have a pay round every year and bonuses and all that sort of stuff. Uh, we measure extensively through that whether we were being fair or are there data trends around differences. So male, female is easy to, to do. It's not easy to do around ethnicity, um, background, age, other demographics. And it's, there are sensitivities with that, but we do measure that. Yeah. And if there's something that's out of kilter, then we ask ourselves, well, why? Is there an unconscious bias or... 
is there something we're getting wrong? Okay. Any more questions? Okay, we've got a few. I think, yeah. Two questions there. Sorry, I was a bit late. I was curious to the public first. My question is Is there any disability organization? I mean, what I mean is speech is not good at all, but just is there any mobility people who work with your organization? That's my question. Did, did you hear that? Sorry, could you just repeat your question? Would you did you say it's social mobility and what the organization? Yeah. Oh, huh? well, I was a bit late. This is what I came. No worries. No, no problem. Consultation. Basically, my question is: Is there any disabled people who work in your organization? Yes. Yeah, disabled people work yes, in your organization. Yes, the answer. Um, look. There could be a wide range of spectrum. We, we capture that. Um, that might range from people who are dyslexic. Um, it might range from uh, visually impaired. I don't think we have anyone in sort of like a wheelchair. Uh, that may be the case, but, but yes is the answer. Uh, and we do capture that data. Um, and we treat people's confidentiality with respect if that's what they want. Yeah. Um, I think we've got two questions here. Uh, so, hello, uh, my name is Mishu and I am uh, doing my master's at Birkbeck uh, oh, in advanced computing. So I wanted to ask that you told us that at 16 your primary concern was taking care of your home and your mother. But in your 20s when you've had done your first graduate role, um, what was your vision for your life and what were your priorities? Because I feel not everyone gets to the point that you've gotten to and I think the difference lies, the difference lies in your mindset. And so I really want you to tell us more about that. Beautiful question. Yeah, um, I'm trying to remember what I was. That's, that's a long time ago for me. Um, <laughs> do you know what is in, So I had a mortgage at 19. Um, uh, before I even made one repayment, the interest rate to 15%. It's like, wow. Um, the only good news of that is when it goes that high up, that becomes the bank's issue, not my issue. Yeah. Um, so I thought hard about paying that and, and, and helping my family and so forth. I think what I, um, I was driven about being the very best version I could be of myself or for those around me. I'm not sure this is behind the question or not, but I can say this as an older man, but what I tend to find is people when they're young have high ambition and as they get older that ambition slows uh, they become more cautious now some of that's driven by you know, you might just be happy in your life and that's great um people say to me things like well how did you get to where you get to and well i've worked really hard is one um and it's, there's been consequence to that along the way and um Maybe there's things I could have done in my life that I haven't yet done in my life. I'm very happy with my life, by the way. And I always then say to people, but it's not about a job or a title or a salary. It's about, are you fulfilled? Are you happy? I've had a job once, which I really didn't like. And getting up every morning to go to that, to that workplace was miserable. And I gave it up after four months because I just hated it. So my view on those things are, if you are happy and fulfilled, whatever that looks like to you as an individual, that's a good thing. Um, and that should be your number one priority, in, in my view. Whatever that looks like, are you happy and fulfilled and leading the life that you really want to lead? Um, you do see people typically, though, as they get older, they plateau because they get distracted by family or whatever they want to do. And they can lose an element of ambition um actually i see that more in men than women which is curious um and i certainly saw that in africa i mean there's very different i mean i just saw many women have much more ambition and do a lot more things with their lives home and managing to uh, work that with the workplace at the same time which is impressive 
That's good to know. <clears throat> That's great. I think we've got a question there. Thank you. Um, my name's Diane Desmulli and I, ha I have studied for a diploma a few years ago. Um, I, was, I was just wondering, Stephen, I mean, obviously the experiences that you've had are now, as you said, quite a long time ago. And thinking now about the problems facing the workforce in the UK um, post-COVID and that so many businesses seem to be saying, again, about, recruit, you know, they haven't got enough staff and the right staff and so forth and so on. Um, you've been the Joint Chair of the Social Mobility um, Commission. What now will you say would be the single most important contributions and changes that could be made that could actually improve um, social mobility now? Not, you know, 30 years ago, whenever, you know. Yeah. Well, I didn't do that 30 years ago, but um, uh, that there are many things. The single biggest thing, ultimately, though, is education and particularly early years education. What we find is if a child, um, by the age of they are seven, has interaction with a business two or three occasions, they are far more likely to end up in good quality paid employment as they get older. Because they're just exposed to that something that they can understand and relate to, maybe has them in a ambition at a very uh, early age. But early years education, exposure to business, that might just be having conversations around sort of working at the dinner table, mm -hmm. for example, at home. Um, that has a really big impact. Um, so early years education is one. Um, that's not easy. You know, you've got often young families, young parents who can't get to, can't put a child into early years education because of poor quality childcare or expensive childcare. Um, so there's a commission we pushed hard for much more free early years uh, education and childcare to support that but it, there's a whole range of things but certainly I, I remember um, not that long ago I, I went to I went to an FE college and I forget the name of it in um, Tower Hamlets now Tower Hamlets is interesting because you've got extreme poverty at one level right next to Canary Wharf with all the big banks and all the wealth that they create. So if you want an example of inequality, that's it. Um, and I remember going to this um, uh, um, FE college. It was nowhere as esteemed as a as university and it's a relatively, I forget the name of the course, I think it was like business administration. These are the kids who are predominantly 16, 17, maybe 18, had bothered to turn up. I'm not sure I was very inspirational because I remember asking any questions, zero hands went up. Never a good outcome. Uh, and the room was just quiet. So the next time we did it, we took a different approach. And I took them to the top floor of the Barker's headquarters in Canary Wharf, which has windows from this floor to the ceiling and over the whole of, of London. And I asked the same question. Oh, I asked a question at the end, then any questions? Immediately 30 hands went up. Can we get some work experience here? They saw something visually that they had no line of sight to before. So it is about creating that opportunity, ambition, insight, and in a way that people don't feel intimidated by it compared to, well, I don't recognise this relative to everybody else I know. I don't think that's changed. I think that's the same thing. Maybe even more so required now. Yeah, I think anything that gives you perspective, learning, um, interaction with others, um, I think, um, I'm not sure what that is that's flashing away there, but uh, yeah, something, uh, flashing something I think is a good thing. And I think, I go back to what I said earlier, if you can articulate the reason why you've done that foundation course, that's good because it turns into, I know what, is, what makes this person tick. They've got a narrative, they've got a story. And I think that makes them more distinct to someone who can't talk to that. That's great. I think that's um, all we have time for today. But one final question from me, if you had to give some a piece of advice to your 16 year old <coughs> self, what would you say? Oh God. Um, on a flippant note, maybe choose a different football team, but... Uh, <laughs> 
Because so, I was on I'm the wrong interested, end of it. I'm interested yeah. in the football team you were supporting. Well, I grew up in Tottenham, so, okay. you know. Well, they were back, well. And I, I was there on Monday night, and it was just awful. But anyway. Um, do you know, it's interesting. I'll, I'll come back to why I say this, given I wasn't 16 at the time, but I was fortunate enough to get sent to Harvard for six months. I had to do my day job whilst I was there, which I did remotely in the hours. And there were... 100 people in the lecture rooms over six months um, from 36 different nationalities, and thank God, only one other banker. Um, I have never looked at the notes I made or the books I got as part of that since I left there. And all it really did was give me the confidence that I was as good as all of those, mm -hmm. and I didn't have the educational background they did. And frankly, it probably got a chip off my shoulder. And if I could then wind myself back to a 16 year old, it would be don't doubt yourself and go for every single opportunity that you possibly can. Because at that age, you've got the, the ability to learn. You tend not to have too much responsibility around you so you can take some risk. That gets harder when you get older. That's a great piece of advice and I think we'll leave it at that. Um, thank you very much, Stephen. Um, very, very inspiring. Thank you to the audience. fantastic thank you Stria, for the questions uh the amount of questions you got in was pretty outstanding thank you Stephen, for i think sharing your story um both when you were young and of course your leadership um approaches and and various jobs and, and for me social mobility is something that has many moving parts part of it is clearly determination part of it is luck so part of it is somebody giving you a break but also knowing what you want to do uh, thank everyone for coming this evening and also for some of the great questions that brought up new ideas and, and new areas that uh, I think can be explored going, going forward. I, I really like the part and there, there was no funds exchanged about education, education, education. Um, and that's the key to it. And that's, I, I think even everyone here tonight is, is here to learn something new and hear something. I've worked with a lot of senior leaders in a lot of different places. Um, and I would have to say... Without a doubt, Stephen is one of the probably the most authentic and honest people and humble in terms of sharing his story with us, both in terms of home life as well as professional life. Um, and that's often called uh, authentic leadership. But it, I, I think in Stephen's case, it's also empathetic. And, and that just goes to show that likability is such a key part of what a leader needs to have to be, in order to be empathetic. I'm sure there's people out there that might have thought, I certainly did. I'd love to have someone like Stephen as a, as a CEO because I think it would be a, a really good place to work. Uh, the last thing uh, to mention is uh, there's other events. Uh, do check the Birkbeck website uh, for other events that we do put on. And the absolute last thing to say is please do join us for a drink in the reception foyer. Uh, but thank you again for, for coming on this um, typical London Wednesday evening. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.